coming right there. All right, guys, welcome back to Tactical Rifleman. Uh, we get asked, uh, uh, we'll be talking to somebody and they'll be like, Carl, I've got no idea what you just said. It's not that they're as tone deaf as I am, it's because a lot of times uh, we speak in military terms or acronyms uh, that we use. An example of that is a 40 mic mic. What we're doing is we're talking about a uh, M203 grenade launcher that's usually mounted underneath like a M16 or a similar weapon like that, right? So yeah, it's, I, you understand there are terms like this. There, uh, so I thought, Let's take an opportunity for me to enlighten you guys on some of these military terms. So um, let's get into it. First, I'm gonna give a shout out to this week's sponsor. All right, hey guys, welcome back. We're gonna go over some military terms, acronyms, some military sayings. Uh, you guys hear them in movies, on TV, and a lot of times you're you're not really sure what it is that they're actually trying to say, right? Uh, I, I'm trying to keep these in alphabetical order, make it easier for uh, some of our guys on the internet that actually take notes on this stuff. Let's start. I don't have any in A's, but uh, I got one that's uh, in the B's, Blue Falcon, right? <laughs> It's a euphemism for buddy f and you're not allowed to say that word on the internet, but that's basically slang for a backstabber, all right? Um, next one's black on, all right? This is when, uh, so if somebody said, uh, let's say they were running uh, low on ammo or, or running low on beans and bullets or low on food, they'd say that I'm black on water or uh, we're black on ammo. It's just a term saying that they're, they're low on stuff. Here's one for you, CENTCOM, C-E-N-T-C-O-M, stands for Central Command, basically down in Tampa, right? So you've got uh, U.S. CENTCOM, Right, United States Central Command, blah, 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 blah. You, you see how the Army really likes their acronyms. There's, there's one that you'll see on TV a lot. I see it every once in a while. It's called C3I. C3I. Really, what does that stand for? Command Control Communications and Intelligence. It actually branches off of... Uh, C2, which was the saying for about a, about a hundred years, C2 just stood for command and control. So if you were going to go attack somebody's headquarters, you were going after the C2 node, the, the command and control node. Uh, some officer trying to get a, a better report or bullet on his officer evaluation report, his OER, another acronym, he added the it went from C2 to C3, and then C3 to C3I, and then from there it went to C4ISTAR, which stands for Command Control Communications, Computers, Intelligence, Surveillance, Target Acquisition, and Reconnaissance. Really? It's the exact same building. You understand it's just a, uh, an officer wanting another uh, basically bullet on his uh, evaluation report. Another officer comes in, says that one's not right. So they change his to C6 ISR, Command Control Communications, Computers, Cyber Defense, Combat Systems Intelligence, Surveillance and Reconnaissance. You understand that's still, you understand that's still Command and Control node. The fact that there's a computer on the guy's desk does not change how we, the good guys, put a satellite-guided bomb through the window. does not matter at all. Again, most of the officers out there, uh, you know we love them, just not that much. Uh, here's something you guys are kind of familiar with, CQB, close quarters battle, but sometimes you'll, you'll hear them say CQC. That's just uh, close quarters combat. They're used interchangeably. There's absolutely zero distance between them, but there's another one very close to that that's called a CTR. What that is is that's a close target recce. Uh, another term, what, the, what does close target recce mean? Basically, like uh, when I was working with Task Force Raptor out in Baghdad, we had the Iraqi Counter-Terrorist Force. We were a CQB unit, hostage rescue, direct action, stuff like that, going out doing the hits. Well, 
you can fly those predator drones overhead all day long, but it can't see through windows. It can't talk to people on the ground. So a lot of times we would do a CTR. What a CTR was, was a close target reconnaissance. Just a fancy way of saying we're going to put three of our uh, booger eaters in a vehicle with one American. They're going to drive through the city, go into deep in the solder city and actually be able to look out the windows of the vehicle and count how many bad guys are right there. Maybe list, uh, lock up cell phones, things like that. That's a close target recce. Here's one that you guys hear a lot. Uh, somebody says, hey, lo, or hey, ho. Right, you, you guys have heard me say that I was on a HALO team. That stands for high altitude, low opening. And then it's, it's sister term, high altitude, high opening. Basically all that means is instead of wearing a regular static line parachute, jumping out at 1200 feet, you're uh, actually wearing a skydiving parachute with an oxygen mask. You can run all the way up to the highest I've ever jumped is 27,000 feet but you can go even higher than that. You just gotta pre-breathe 100% oxygen a little bit longer. But the idea is you, that plane can fly by so high, nobody ever hears it. You can jump out at 27,000 feet, come all the way down to 4,000 feet, start your opening procedures. Uh, so high altitude, jump, low opening. By the time you're under canopy, you've got a good parachute. You're at about 2,000, 2,500 feet. Gives you time to figure out where you're at, where your buddies are. You stack up and you land. All right. Now, the problem with that is sometimes the enemy has radar. They can pick up that plane. So the flip side, a hey-ho, you jump out at 27,000 feet. You immediately open your parachutes at like 25,000. You stack up all the parachutes, high altitude jump, high altitude opening, H-A-H-O, and now we're all driving our parachutes. It's a lot harder to see parachutes and uh, little Green Beret stick figures on radar compared to like a C-130. If you've got the winds going in the right direction and you've calculated it, you can go sometimes more than 20 kilometers. Guys, you understand, you could cross whole international borders just doing that. So it was kind of cool. So you'll hear people say, well, he's on a halo team. Yes, he's on a halo team, a military free fall team, but they also do hey ho operations. Kind of neat, right? Kind of neat. Another one that you'll hear a lot of times is, hey, that's a hardened site. Basically, all we're talking about is that that structure, uh, usually built underneath rock or concrete, it was designed to withstand uh, conventional bombing, maybe a nuclear blast, biological, chemical uh, attacks, stuff like that. Cheyenne Mountain, deep inside the Rocky Mountains, you understand that that is a hardened site. All right. Um, some sites are a lot harder than others. It, you know, it all depends what it is built to withstand. Another, another phrase you guys might hear is high speed. That individual is high speed. It's just saying that he's highly motivated or he's at or near the peak of his efficiency. Uh, a Green Beret, he, that's a high speed, low drag individual. He's a professional in his field. He has had a lot more training, uh, you understand? And then you've got your low speed uh, knuckle draggers. Um, and I'm not bashing them, I'm, I'm not. Uh, there's been uh, times where, and you need everybody in the military, but there are some people that don't wanna work as hard as others, no big deal. That's just part of it, it's just part of it. Not bad at all. One of my favorites is one that's called ISR. You'll, you'll hear me talk about, well, we had ISR coverage on the target. All that stands for the actual letters, ISR, Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. But basically what it actually stands for is we've put a Predator drone or some other type of uh, UAV over the top of the target. Now, uh, it will, you know, you guys see the little gimbal underneath it. That is a day-night um, TV camera basically it, it can see thermal majority of them but they also might also have a um, without getting into the classified names for them it'll have a box in it that can act as a cell phone tower and you can actually lock up guys cell phones so you're actually able to gather signal intelligence you're able to pull surveillance of the target but also like if we had three or four or even just two uh, predator platforms, we'd have one over the target 
making sure the bad guys don't leave. And then the other one would be doing reconnaissance of our route, following the assault forces we were moving to the target, to make sure there weren't any bad guys out there, you know, burying roadside bombs, stuff like that, right? Because that stuff happens real life, unfortunately. Welcome back from that commercial. Jays, one of my favorite things to see coming in overseas is called that JDAM, J-D-A-M. Stands for Joint Direct Attack Munition. That's just a fancy way of saying a satellite guided bomb. You can take any dumb bomb uh, that the Air Force has or Navy. Uh, for example, a 2,000 pound bomb uh, where we used to put like a, a, uh, a laser guided head on the front of it that just threaded on the front. Now they don't do that. Now the back of it they thread on what's called a, well, basically the JDAM munition part. And that's why they put it on the back because when they drop this bomb, it's got to, remember, it's seeing the satellites up above. It is satellite guided. If you put the 10 digit grid coordinates where you want that satellite guided bomb to hit, a 10 digit grid coordinate for you guys, that's basically three feet by three feet, a one meter square on the planet. That plane can be flying up above in the clouds. And when the bomb senses the GPS satellites, it kind of tells the pilot, yeah, I can hit it from here within like a box. Pilot drops the bomb, fins pop open on it, and it steers and it will hit one meter by one meter square. They used to only come on 2000 pound bombs because they were expensive, but now, a 2,000 pound bomb that's a little big to drop in the middle of Fallujah. So they went down to 1,000 pound bombs, 500 pound bomb. I don't know how small they can go with them now. Again, some of this stuff, borderline, classified. Let's stay away from it. I mentioned um, meters and things like that. So that's where the term clicks come from. We're still in alphabetical order. K-L-I-C-K-S, clicks, like clicks on a scope. No, we're talking about kilometers. You'll hear them say in the movies, man, we gotta go just three more clicks. Three more clicks means you gotta go three more miles, or basically three more kilometers, not three more miles. When, <laughs> it's actually a joke in the military when they say, when somebody asks, how much further do we have to go? If you don't know, we always say two more clicks. We gotta go two more clicks. That's basically saying, I don't have a clue how far we gotta go. We just gotta go. Gotta go two more clicks. Fun for, fun for the whole family. What about Molly? M-O-L-L-E. Everybody runs Molly on their gun belts. They run Molly on their, uh, they run Molly on their body armor. You know, their plate carriers and stuff, but who actually knows what Molly stands for? It stands for Modular Lightweight Load Carrying Equipment, which basically has nothing to do with it. All it is is Molly is a certain type of attachment system that's got the little one inch loops and you weave this stuff through. It allows uh, people to change locations of pouches, mag pouches, radio pouches, whatever, all over their kit. The Molly system showed up right about the same time the global war on terror started. And um, yeah, that was new to us, but now fast forward, everything's got Molly on it. You see civilian vehicles with Molly on it, but thought you guys might want to know Molly. Molly, that's kind of cool, right? Next, next one's called Oscar Mike. You, uh, you see it on t-shirts sometimes. It's a, a guy's t-shirt will say Oscar Mike. What does that mean? It means on the move or another way, I'm, I'm on the way. You know, I'm on my way to go. Um, so if you see somebody's Oscar Mike, he, this guy is on the move. Okay, cool, cool. Another one that they call a lot is called, um, you, you'll hear the phrase QRF. We're waiting for the QRF to get here. QRF just stands for quick reaction force. That's a good thing, all right? You don't ever want to call for the QRF, uh, but it's good to always have a QRF coordinated before you go outside the wire. Important stuff, right? We, and that was a big part of our, the, uh, the job for the day walkers is they would actually uh, get on the SAP phones, each individual unit of the battle space that we were getting ready to go do ops that night. They would call and coordinate with the battle space owners. Hey, 
we're going to be doing a raid by helicopter, such and such grid coordinates. You own that battle space. Can you provide us a quick reaction force? And then if we had like two, three ops that night, you'd have to do that for each, uh, each area. So there's a lot of coordination that goes into doing ops on a, on a modern battlefield. Uh, you know, uh, medevac plans and this, that, and just permission to cross into their battle space. There's all kinds of coordinations that have to go on. But for me personally, the two important ones are always going to be medevac, uh, but QRF, getting that quick reaction force in case something goes wrong. All right, they're very, very important. Here's one for you. It's called R-E-M-F, REMF. If, uh, if, you're sitting there like, that That guy's a REMF right there. Hey, man, now don't worry about him. He's a REMF. Stands for Rear Echelon Motherfucker. Now, we had to bleep that out because this is, uh, this is YouTube. But the reality is, in real life, you know, we try not to use a lot of profanity around other people in the military. So we don't say that guy's a Rear Echelon Motherfucker right in front of everybody. You just say... Hey, he's a remf. Don't worry about him. You know, yeah, I know he outranks us, but he's a remf. Don't worry about him. All right. Um, here's another one. RPG. You guys hear RPGs all the time. In the movies, you'll hear them yell, RPG! And then all of a sudden, there'll be a big explosion. That RPG, the, 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 uh, the actual acronym stands for Rocket Propelled Grenade. It's usually dealing with the Soviet era uh, type stuff, the RPG-7, uh, things like that. But uh, your law rockets, your, um, your um, small Ds, things like that, they kind of fall in the same thing. It is basically man-portable uh, rockets that are shot at you. Just a term. Um, it's important to know if the bad guys have got RPG capabilities because a RPG, just about all of them, have shape charges in them that are capable of taking out like up armored Humvees, things like that. So important to know. Here's an older one for you, also starts with an R. It's called RTO. Right? Uh, RTO stands for Radio Telephone Operator. Now, um, it's an older term because back in the day, a, uh, that was kind of how snipers spotted. Uh, commanders on the battlefield because not everybody had radios back then. The colonel, that officer, would be walking around and if he was a platoon sergeant or um, a platoon leader, he might have one RTO, one guy carrying the radio with the antenna next to him. Okay, that's a lieutenant, maybe a captain. But if you've got a guy walking around and he's got three RTOs around him with their big antennas up in the air, if he's got three RTOs, that's a, that's a major or above. You're talking, you probably got a colonel. So that's, you shoot that guy first, right? You, you take that officer first, then you start taking the radio guys. So the term RTO, a radio telephone operator, remember a lot of times uh, radios are unreliable. So between fighting positions, especially if you know that they have um, radio intercept capabilities, we would run what we call comma wire from position to position and that we would actually put in telephones. Well, it's the same thing. Those RTOs, their job was to monitor those field telephones. A little bit, a little bit of uh, military history there for you. Some of these acronyms go a long, long ways back. Here's a term you'll hear them say from time to time, salad bar. Now, salad bar, uh, to some of you guys, I know looking at a lot of the people out there, it's uh, you guys think salad bar means dessert bar or ice cream bar. Um, but that in the military, when we say salad bar, what we're referring to is the service ribbons that are uh, worn on somebody's military uniform. Uh, when I retired, I think I was authorized to wear like uh, 22 or 23 ribbons. I think the most I ever wore was uh, 18 or 19. I couldn't even tell you what some of them are for. I uh, still couldn't to this day. Uh, I think my top one said continued on back. I looked like, Mar I looked like Manuel Noriega, you know, some, uh, some Mexican general. But that's a big deal to a lot of people in the military. They like their, they like their salad bar. They, they really do. It's a way of at promotion boards to look because a, a promotion board, you've got all your enlisted reports, but there's a, a Department of Army photo, a DA photo that goes to that promotion board. 
And that's the first thing those command sergeant majors look at. They go, okay, hey, this guy's got halo wings. Hey, this guy's got a ranger tab. Hey, this guy's got a combat medic badge. Uh, okay, hey, he's also got a bronze star. He's got this, he's got that. So where a, a lot of people say, uh, you know, this, your salad bar really doesn't matter, and it really doesn't matter after you retire. But while you're in the military, uh, it's kind of important. It really is, really is important. Another phrase you guys hear, uh, and a lot of the gear dudes talk about it too, the guys in video games and stuff like, hey man, uh, he's got sappy plates. What they're talking about when they say sappy plates is they, they use that term to basically cover all body armor, hard plates that, that guys put in their plate carriers that they like to wear when they're uh, out LARPing or they're out, uh, out at the shooting range. But understand uh, that the term is kind of misused, right? But SAPI actually stands for Small Arms Protective Insert. Right? It's, it's basically rating a certain type of plate. Now, uh, in general, there are exceptions, of course, but in general, most of your army uh, plates were SAPI plates. They were designed to stop one round. In other words, no matter what you shot at these plates, they would hit once it shattered the ceramic, the Kevlar on the back of it would absorb it. The guy'd be down, but the sniper didn't kill him. And then you could drag him off. Now your soft guys, we our plates were a little bit heavier, but our plates were what were called multi-hit plates. They had to be able to take 10 hits before they were considered no longer effective. Why would a guy need to get hit multiple times? Well, I, not me personally, my plates have never been shot. Right? But I know a guy who had to fight his way up a staircase and he, he made it to the top of the staircase. It was a guy shooting an AK down doing this. And uh, he, they got up there, they saved the day and um, finished the op. Afterwards, he hurt. But he, when he went and checked, he had taken three AK rounds to his plate. And uh, it had destroyed the magazines on the front of his plate carrier. One was up above it. And you understand it's important to invest in plates that are multi-hit. It, it is. It's important, guys. Let's get an S. There's a bunch of S right off the bat. Snake Eater, a member of the United States Army Special Forces. Special Forces, important stuff. You get in a sit rep. Hey, man, can you give me a sit rep? S-I-T-R-E-P. It stands for a situation report. Hey, man, how are things going? Give me the, it's usually done like the five W's. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. All right? Um, you know, what's, what's going on? Hey, man, what are you doing? Tell us. Hey, need a sit rep. It kind of sucks because you'd get a call. You'd be hitting a target. Now, remember, they're watching you on Kill TV because they got the ISR up there, that Predator drone. Well, generals and all these armchair generals are sitting there watching the op. And they'd call on the radio, hey, uh, we need a sit rep. Like they got any control over what's happening on the ground. As they, hey, we're in the middle of a gunfight right now, I'll call you back. You know, but they, you got people always asking you for a sit rep. You know, guys, we're a little busy right now. Here's one that uh, you guys get with an S, smoke, the, the word smoke. Obviously, it means smoke grenade, right? Uh, yeah, but in the military, especially for you younger guys in the military, uh, it's got a much more uh, devious term. And uh, basically, if I say I'm going to go over there and smoke those two privates, what I'm saying is I'm going to punish those service members with excessive physical work. Uh, due, a, due to a minor infraction. In other words, they did something wrong that I'm not really gonna, I'm, I'm not really gonna have to do paperwork on or try to take their rank away from or anything, but it just means, you know, hey, um, they screwed something up. And uh, to make it so they don't ever want to ever do it again, I'm gonna have them go do grass drills. Roll left, roll right, do push-ups, do sit-ups, do more push-ups, do more sit-ups. Do flutter kicks, uh, you know, you do 404 count flutter kicks and, uh, and uh, 28 count bodybuilders, which is just the exercise. Uh, yeah, you get them their target heart rate. Trust me, they're not gonna wanna throw that cigarette butt on the Sergeant Major's grass anymore. They're just not gonna wanna do it. Remember CENTCOM, that was way up in C. Here's another one a lot like it. 
SOCOM, S-O-C-O-M, Special Operations Command. You'll hear, sometimes you'll hear U.S. SOCOM, United States Special Operations Command, right? Easy stuff. It's just, uh, you'll hear somebody say, hey, that's a JSOC, uh, Joint um, Combined Special Operations Command. You, uh, that's a SOCOM thing. That's a USAFIC. That's a USASOC. United States Army Special Forces Command, or Special Operations Command. Uh, you see how all they just change letters around a little bit and it gives you, well, now I need one more headquarters with a whole new general, with a whole new staff of officers underneath him, a whole new headquarters building, and they're basically all making the same, machines, uh, same decisions, stepping all over themselves. Just, it is what it is, guys. It's just part of it. Here's one, let's go back to some more tactical stuff. Right, this is going to be my last one in the S, the word squirter. No, I'm not talking about you just had too many shots of tequila after some Mexican food. Not at all. If somebody says over the radio, hey, we've got a squirter, basically what they're saying is they're, uh, they're telling you that there's an enemy that has ran off the target. Sometimes they'll jump out windows, they'll jump off the rooftop, they'll take off and go run out into that palm grove and hide. The cool thing about palm groves is those branches are so thick, a lot of times the thermal sights from the Predator drones can't see through them, which means you've got to send somebody in there. There's been a lot of Americans shot, there have been a lot of military working dogs shot from sending the dogs into those uh, palm groves looking for that squirter, all right? Um, it just, it, it is what it is. So we've had squirters that have literally ran five, six, seven kilometers. Uh, we would just have the Predator drone or the AC-130 Spectre gunship. Uh, we don't need you. Go follow him. And they'll follow him for miles and miles. They'll eventually go hide in a bush thinking that they're good. And then when we're all done on target, we have one of the helicopters come in. You put an assault cell on the helicopter. They fly straight to his bush. They get off and he gets captured after having just ran five, maybe seven kilometers, uh, completely wore out, all sweaty and everything. In the wintertime, it's kind of awesome because uh, you'll fly with the helicopter doors open just to let him freeze his butt off. We want to get into T, we have to do TOT, time on target. Uh, a lot of times it'll be like the snipers are up and then we're like, hey, what's the TOT for the assault force? Time on target, what time's the assault force is going to get that? So military gets used to saying it, but basically it's what's your ETA for your arrival, All right? So if you hear a military guy say, hey, my TOT is 8.30, he's saying, yeah, even though he told you he's going to be there at 8 o'clock for coffee, he just texts you, TOT 8.30, he's running 30 minutes late, All right? Uh, TOT, time on target. Well, a lot of them, you guys probably know this one, Wilco, all right? If somebody says Wilco, that just means I will comply, all right? Uh, hey, man, go do this right now, Wilco. Roger, Wilco. Roger, I understand. Wilco, I will comply, all right? So Wilco, one of my favorite one in W's is the word Winchester, all right? Uh, it just means I'm out of ammo. And I, okay, I'm a hey, dude. We got in such a gunfight. I was almost Winchester on the minigun. That means you're having a great night, right? It is, except for when you're right there and you realize your hoppers are almost empty of ammo. When you've got two F-16s pulling close air support for you, and they're making gun runs, or maybe an A-10s making gun runs, and all of a sudden you hear, you know, the JTAC is like, "Hey, we need another gun run." and they come back, hey man, we're, uh, we're Winchester. That's not the term you wanna hear over the radio. It's not, because that means one of your most powerful weapons on the battlefield doesn't have any more ordnance. So um, yeah, we like to use it a lot, man. Yeah, hey, I, hey, I'm Winchester, I gotta go back, rejam my mags. You're on the range shooting, you're out of ammo, I gotta go back, rejam all my magazines before we do the next drill. We use it a lot, the term Winchester, out of ammo. No big deal when you're on the shooting range, but if you're in the middle of a gunfight, yeah, when that Apache has been uh, providing cover for you, your hill's getting ready to get overran, yeah, it's not what you want to hear from the Apache. It's not what you want to hear from the AC-130 Spectre gunship. 
Now, uh, right, because the AC-130 uh, carries so much ammo, one of five howitzer, 40 millimeter boffers, the 25 millimeter Gatling guns, they carry a lot of ordnance. And my old unit, I was not there. I flew in the night, uh, the night after, I flew in that night and got to do SSE the next day, sensitive site exploitation. But uh, my old unit uh, down in the Joff em completely emptied a AC-130 Winchester. We're out of ammo. A second one came in, that one completely Winchester. When it left, the first one had re rearmed, came back, they emptied that one, and then the second AC-130 came in, and it ran out at nighttime. The sun was starting to come up, so it finally had to leave. That battle, uh, you can look it up. It's called the Army of Heaven in the Joff. I want to say it was 2007 time frame. Uh, I'm not exaggerating at all, but can you imagine what kind of a gunfight they were in to empty three and a half AC-130 uh, gunships, Winchester. All right, um, here's another one for you. We're going to wrap this up right here, guys. Uh, the term Zulu, Zulu, uh, Zulu time. So if I say uh, we're gonna, we are gonna hit the target at uh, uh, 222 Zulu. Basically, uh, that is a time zone equivalent for the coordinated universal time or uh, CUT, which is basically what the rest of the planet uses. But the military, a lot of their clocks will have 24 hours going all the way around. And uh, a lot of our ops would run on Zulu time. So that way, any aircraft that were flying in from different time zones, or if you were getting on the helicopters going to a different time zone, everybody was on the same sheet of music. Most of our operations were done on a uh, on Zulu time. You might hear somebody say um, 06 Lima, local. That's just saying local time. Okay, that's fine for easier for people to remember. But if you're doing a big operation, they're almost always done on Zulu time. They were, uh, they really were. Guys, I could go on and on and on with this. There are so many military acronyms. Let me know if you guys got anything out of this. Put the comments below. You know, I read them all. Uh, I literally, I, I, started thinking about this i wrote them out i had over a hundred acronyms we did about 30 right now let me know if this is something you guys would like to see more of there's lots of them that are used in the movies tv that uh you know they want to be more and more accurate in their depiction of the military okay fine whatever um but if you need some uh deciphering of what is going on uh let me know i can do a part two to this anyways that's all i got y'all take care and shoot straight